So I wanted to do a video on my new over the top hardware hacking project. It all started because of one of these. Now this is the remote for my building's parking garage. I wanted a spare one to put it on my bicycle. So I went and asked, could I get a spare remote? And they told me that they cost a hundred dollars. Now I know that these don't cost a hundred dollars to produce because they're about five dollars worth of technology. So like most sensible people, I told them I'm not gonna spend a hundred dollars. What I am gonna do is spend thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours of my time finding a workaround. Now this was one of those projects that kind of just spiraled out of control. It started off seemingly simple and just kept getting more and more complex. The initial plan was to just buy a cheap remote off of Amazon, figure out the garage door code with my Flipper Zero, and then program the code into the remote, which was easy enough. Except after I bought the remote, I learned that that's actually not how garage doors work. You don't program the code into the remote, you program the remote code into the door. So I don't really wanna go and mess around with the apartment garage door because I'm not looking to get evicted. Now that we know that the remotes are not programmable, we might as well open them up and see what's inside. Now I'm not sure that I can get the camera to focus enough so that you'll be able to read this, but this is a PIC 12F microcontroller which is actually reprogrammable. So while the remote itself isn't programmable, the chip on it is. So we can probably mess with that. And quite helpfully here, you can see that there is a header. Now PIX supports something known as in-circuit serial programming. And that basically allows you to flash the chip while it's still connected to the circuit which is great if you've ever worked with a chip that doesn't have that. It basically just boils down to desoldering the chip from the circuit, putting it into a chip programmer, writing your code to it, resoldering it into the circuit, and then your code doesn't work. And then you just go back and forth on a loop forever. So all we need to do is figure out the pinout of this header. Now there's a couple of ways you can do this. The first is by tracing the pins. You can actually follow the traces on the circuit board all the way from the chip or whatever component they're connected to, to the header. Um, the problem with that is that the uh, traces can often pass through the middle of the circuit board and come out the other side. So you kind of end up flipping side to side on the circuit, trying to figure out where this uh, trace is going. My preferred method of figuring out pin headers is using the multimeter. It has something known as continuity mode, which basically causes one of the leads to emit a small current. When the current is detected in the other lead, it's gonna emit a tone. Now, I'm pretty sure that the pin header is for the programming interface, so all of the pins should go to legs on the chip. So what we can simply do is put one lead on one of the pins and then just go down each leg of the chip until we get a tone. So now it's time to see if I can still remember how to solder. It's basically been since high school, so I'm just gonna really hope for the best at this point. I did buy this very nice chip holder off of Amazon, which has served me really, really well. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any safety glasses, so I'm gonna be wearing my Cyberpunk laser protection goggles. I basically can hardly see anything because it's filtering out half of the visible light frequencies as well. But it should be enough to just solder this header on. Okay, and I think we're done. So what I've done here is I've hooked my chip up to my PIC programmer so I can read and write it from my MacBook over here. Now, while trying to read it, I found out that it actually has a security feature called read protection. And what this does is it's basically DRM. It stops you from reading the firmware or the uh, ROM off of the chip. Now, there are some ways around this, which I think I might cover in another video, but it's not gonna matter at all here because while trying to read the chip, I accidentally erased it. So even if I do bypass the firmware protection, it doesn't matter because there's nothing on there. So the project basically just keeps getting bigger because now I'm gonna have to write the firmware from scratch. So first up, we actually need to reverse engineer the board and figure out a little bit more about how it works. We already figured out the programming header earlier, and I figured out that the switch is GP3 using my multimeter. The LEDs I couldn't seem to find, I'm guessing because they're going through a resistor which is preventing my multimeter from sending a current. So what I'm basically gonna do is just brute force them. We're gonna set the GPIO header to zero, which basically sets all the pins to zero or low. So it's basically not gonna output a voltage. And then I'm gonna set the TRIS-IO header to 02, which basically sets all of the pins to output. Now we know that the switch isn't an output, but it doesn't really matter right now. And then what we'll just do is we'll go through each individual pin, turn the pin on, wait a couple of milliseconds, and then turn it off. And then we can see based on how the board behaves, what pin is doing what. Now a quick warning, this is an RF device. So messing with the transmit pin is going to transmit a signal. 
Okay, so that was kind of unexpected. It has lit up both of the LEDs. So what I think's happened here is the LEDs have been wired in backwards. So rather than going from the chip pin to ground, they're going from the chip pin to voltage, which means when nothing is turned on, there is still a voltage going into the LED and they're lighting up. Now this isn't a huge problem. It just means that in order to turn the LEDs off, we actually have to apply a voltage to them so that the voltage across the LED is equal on both sides. So basically the, what this looks like in our code is every time we want to turn the LED off, we set it to one. And when we want to turn it on, we set it to zero. Figured out that the LEDs are GP4 and GP5. It turns out there's actually two LEDs there. I thought there was just one. There's a green and a red. Um, now we know which pins correspond to the LEDs. We have to keep them high in order to keep the LEDs off. So now I'm just gonna write a very simple script to see if we can make the switch do something. I'm just gonna check if the switch is triggered. And then if it is, we're gonna put one of the LEDs on. And if not, we're just gonna turn it off. Off. So there we have it. We can push the switch and light a light. Not very exciting, but if you've never done hardware before, it's a goal to achieve. So um, that's basically the most simple firmware we can write. Now it's gonna be kind of a draw the rest of the owl moment because I'm not gonna go through the entire firmware development process uh, in the video but I will show you the final product and how it works. So while I was looking for documentations on the protocol for these remotes, I actually stumbled across a CCC talk by someone who had basically done the exact same thing that I'm doing now, even down to having the same exact remote. And I was actually able to find a lot about how the firmware works from his version, which he uploaded to GitHub. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but I was able to fix it, so I will post a fixed version as well. So we're just gonna write the firmware onto the device and then see if we can get a radio signal. I did also make a uh, police siren firmware, which just alternates between the two LEDs. It's completely useless, but I figured why not. Now I did actually want to see if the microcontroller had enough memory that I could program Rick Astley onto it because then I could play the song over the garage door frequency and you'd be able to pick it up with an AM radio. Unfortunately, I think that's actually illegal and it violates a ton of FCC laws. So I'm not gonna do that, but it would have been a cool project idea and probably the world's funniest signal jammer. So as a test, I programmed my remote to send the code 1337 because why not? So we're gonna see if we can pick it up on the flipper zero. I've uh, set this to 318 megahertz, which is the garage gate remote frequency. And we're just gonna press the button and see what happens. So as you can see, we picked up our mega code. This is actually the encoded format. So I'm just gonna go into the menu so as you can see, the serial number is 0x1337. So there you have it. I went from basically needing a spare remote to writing my own firmware. Uh, these projects really do have a habit of spiraling out of control, but it was fun. I learned a lot. I haven't done any pick programming ever, so that was super cool. I also got the SDR, so we can actually check out the frequencies with that. So if you like hardware hacking or really any hacking, then I highly recommend subscribing to my channel, and I'm gonna be out with more videos.